Um, so welcome everybody. My name is Christina Bell and I'm the program manager for Atlantic Institute. And today we have our third tour of faith. We are meeting with Rachel and she is um, going to give us um, a tour of the Church of Christ Scientist, the Christian, Christian Science Faith. So I'm gonna go ahead and let her go ahead and get started and um, share with us her presentation she has. If you have questions, please put them in the chat and I will ask them as we go. Sure. Yeah, we can pause for questions throughout or I've also kind of built in a time for Q&A at the end as well. So, but it doesn't need to be a super formal thing where we wait to the end. Um, so hi everyone. My name is Rachel Hansen. Um, I'm here sitting in a Christian science reading room, which is maybe uh, maybe the only thing that you've ever <laughs> known about Christian science is that you see reading rooms around sometimes. Um, and I'm just here to talk to you about what Christian science is. Um, it happens that I'm a member of uh, the Sixth Church of Christ Scientist in Washington, DC. And um, you'll, you'll learn through our discussion here that um, we, we're sort of known in the public as Christian science, or, uh, but our formal church name is the Church of Christ Scientist. Uh, and then we are, we, we are the sixth one that opened in Washington, DC. <laughs> uh, so that's why the sixth. Every different cities have different numbers of churches. So like Los Angeles, I think has upwards of, or at one time had upwards of 30. So there's like a 30, a 30th church of Christ scientists in LA. Um, so you'll just see that wherever you are, if you happen to encounter Christian science churches. Um, and when, if, you, if you're ever out and you see a Christian science reading room, what that also means is that there must be a church nearby or in that city somewhere because one of the sort of requirements of our churches is that we maintain reading rooms um, and I'll talk more about what exactly a reading room is but they they always come in pairs um, so there's a church nearby if you ever see a reading room um, we're I should say also that we're a branch of what we call the Mother Church, which is the first Church of Christ Scientist in Boston, Massachusetts. And that's um, the, the very first one ever, but also the sort of headquarters of the Global Christian Science Church. Um, so a person like me, I'm, I'm a member of this local church, but I'm also a member of the, the Mother Church, the church in Boston, and many people maintain both those memberships um, because one encompasses the whole kind of global congregation and then there are local branches. So this here, we just have a little picture of where we are. <laughs> That's the outside of our church on a different day when it's not raining. Um, and this is the, the front of our church building, which you'll see in our case looks very traditionally churchy, <laughs> but not all of them are. Some some churches have operate in storefronts. Some have very modern buildings. Um, some are, are sort of mobile and happen in different places and don't own their buildings um, or don't own any building. And so they might even move around. I knew of a, a congregation outside of Boston that um, didn't didn't have a building and during the winter they met in the the kind of community room of their bank that was available for for bank members to use for things so they held church services in there and then in the summer they just met in the park outside and sat on the grass um so you'll see all kinds um we just happen to exist in this very churchy looking one and so i guess now i'll kind of launch into the, the basic stuff about what we believe. I'm gonna talk first just kind of about our basic beliefs and um, what we think about God and who Mary Baker Eddy is, um, if you haven't heard her name in conjunction with Christian science. Um, and then I'm also gonna talk through just some, 
some common misconceptions um, that you you may have encountered if you know anything about Christian Science. Um, one one thing one thing yeah. to ask you real quick as Gail was just saying she's been to the church in Boston. Oh, she said, "Is uh -huh. isn't there a reading room? Isn't it there a reading room that has the amazing room size globe from 1938?" Um, so they do have that. That's called the Maparium, and yes, that's that is actually headquartered in a building that's part of the the sort of complex that called that's called the Christian Science Publishing Society. Um, that the church in Boston happens to maintain its own reading room that's a little bit down the street. So where you saw the vaparium is not in the reading room, but you're correct that that is part of that whole church complex um, up there in Boston. Um, so, hold on, I'm just gonna like scoot this over so I can see all my notes at the same time as the slides. And you guys, I should have brought a bigger computer. Um, <laughs> I so know the struggle is real. Science. I've done yeah. this many times. I'm like, it's okay. I'll I'll nobody, it nobody's here in person on this rainy day because that would just add like a whole other layer of stuff to think about and be aware of. Um, so I can just focus on you and <laughs> keep myself together here. Um, so what is Christian science? Uh, well, we're a Christian denomination and we study the Bible, we consider Christ Jesus the Messiah. Um, our church organization is, as I mentioned, the Church of Christ Scientist, which is a global church and it has local branches um, all across the US, but also all over the world. Um, Christian science is also, an ex we, we think of it as an explanation of how Jesus healed the sick and sinning and raised the dead. And it's something that anybody can learn and practice. Um, Jesus told his disciples that anybody who, that believed in him would do the things, the works that he did, and greater, uh, and Christian science shows us how to do that and explains how he did that. Um, I also like to think of it as a spiritual discipline, so in addition to being a religion and a church organization and a Christian denomination, all those kind of traditional ways that we think about faith, um, I particularly like the word discipline um, because it really is just a daily discipline. It's not just a membership card. It's not a weekly social event. <laughs> um, it's, it's something that you, you undertake individually every day. Um, and I, I not, it's not the same as like yoga or meditation or something, but in the same way that any of those things are just things that you, you have to do and practice to get good at. <laughs> Uh, and to see results from Christian Christian science is um, is like that. Uh, so that's why I chose that word discipline that I particularly like. Um, and I included here this quote from, oops, sorry, that, trying to click on it and it made the slides again, um, from a book by Mary Baker Eddy, who I'll talk more about in a minute. Um, so when asked to define what Christian science is, her response was it's the law of God, the law of good, interpreting and demonstrating the divine principle and rule of universal harmony. So who is Mary Baker Eddy? Um, she was a writer, teacher, and healer in the late 19th century. She was born in 19, uh, sorry, 1821 uh, and passed on in 1910. And she's the founder of this church and also the leader of the Christian science movement. Um, I mean, obviously she's not living anymore, so she, <laughs> she isn't leading it anymore, uh, but she was the leader at the time <laughs> of, during her lifetime. Um, she founded the church initially in 1879 and describes its purpose to commemorate the word and works of our master, which is Christ Jesus, and to reinstate primitive Christianity and its lost element of healing. Um, she's the author of the textbook, what we call the textbook of Christian science, of Christian healing, which is called Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. This was published in 1875. And actually that came about because she, a, um, a patient had been referred to her after the physician that was tending to this patient gave up because he didn't think he could do anything else to help this person and just thought that they would die. And then she healed them. <laughs> 
And he was pretty impressed. And so he told her she ought to write what she was doing and down in a book so that other people could learn and understand how it worked. Um, and so that also came about, um, she had a kind of, kind of falling apple um, experience in 1866, which was her own healing. Um, and then be, during that time, between that initial kind of aha, what's going on here, um, and, and 1875, when she published this book, she was had, first was kind of digging into the Bible and trying to understand how she had been healed. And then after coming to an understanding, she started healing other people. And then as that grew and more and more people became curious, she had also started teaching other people how she was healing. Um, and so then that kind of finally came to fruition um, in, in writing and then publishing this book. Um, and it's called Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. Um, it's actually sort of two books in one. So um, this, this second part with Key to the Scriptures is actually a pair of exegeses uh, on the, the books of Genesis and Revelation. Um, so that really kind of dives into biblical interpretation. Uh, and then the rest of it is um, refers heavily, very heavily to the Bible, but isn't that kind of like verse by verse breakout. Um, so, so yes, that's Mary Baker Eddy. Uh, we'll go on to the next slide now. So these are just two quotes that I pulled out to kind of give you an idea of what Christian science thinks of the Bible. And I'm going to pause here for a second. I'm, I'm seeing on my screen that someone named Catherine is in the waiting room. Do you see that? I don't Should see that on my screen. screen. Yes, go ahead. Oh, I don't okay. see that on my screen. I'll go ahead and admit. I mean, maybe you already did and mine is just slow or something. Yeah, I don't know. Um, oh, and I'm seeing on the, I'm seeing a reference to I.M. Pei uh, as a prominent architect that had been, had done several Christian science churches. Um, that's, that's true. Uh, so, so yes, these two quotes, um, just to give you an idea of kind of what we think about God so that you can read these, but I'll just read them out loud too, so we can pause and consider them. <laughs> the Christian science God is universal, eternal, divine love, which changeth not and causeth no evil, disease, nor death. And that's from Science and Health. And then in the, in the back of Science and Health also, there's a chapter that's a glossary um, of terms. And, and so most of these are, are terms that she's pulled from the Bible and it's kind of giving, giving a definition. Sometimes there are sort of two parts of the definition which have, you might can think of as like two different levels. So there's sort of a spiritual way to think about this. And then there's a very like earthly material way to think about whatever particular mm -hmm. word it is. Um, so that's, that's there to help people help help serve as this key to the scriptures to kind of understand unlock what the bible is saying and make more sense of it um so her definition of god in that glossary is the great i am which is a reference to uh god describing himself uh in in the book of genesis the great i am the all-knowing all-seeing all-acting all-wise all-loving and eternal and then um, she includes these, what we sort of refer to <laughs> as the seven synonyms, um, much like in Islam, they have the 99 names for God. So we just have seven names. Um, but principle, mind, soul, spirit, life, truth, and love are these biblically derived names that she uses kind of synonymous, synonymously and interchangeably to, to bring out different um, different concepts and different qualities about God as she's writing. And so anytime, if you were looking through Science and Health or her other writings, if you see those words capitalized, they're referring to God. Uh, and then the final thing, all substance and intelligence. So how do Christian scientists practice their faith? Um, and I, I should pause here also and, and say, so commonly we're, we're called and we refer to ourselves as Christian scientists. Sometimes you'll also hear people say students of Christian science. 
um, it's not, I have a, a kind of not super strong, but, but their preference for referring to myself as a student of Christian science, um, back to that idea of this being a discipline, um, because I, you know, it's something, it's something that I study and work at every day. Um, and so I, I just like to kind of acknowledge my own, <laughs> my own path and growth in that, uh, when I talk about myself, there's also a, an instruction that Mary Baker Eddy gives um, that people are not to, what adherents or members of her church um, are not to publish, kind of publish their own names or refer to themselves publicly with the title of Christian scientist um, and, and using, like if I were to say Rachel Hansen, comma CS, the way that like a, a doctor would say MD or I might say MS because I have a master of science. Um, Christian scientists are not supposed to refer to themselves as Rachel Hansen CS unless they are in the full-time professional practice of healing on the basis of Christian science. Um, so that's not, it's not a thing that's like a really big deal or to a point to criticize anyone who just calls themselves a Christian scientist. but. Um, that is a, a kind of interesting distinction. And I'll talk more about what it means to even be in the full-time healing practice. Um, but so most, what this looks like for most of us is that uh, we attend two church services e each week. There's a Sunday morning service that uh, to most of you, if you have ever been to a Christian church would look a lot like a very traditional Christian church service. Um, then we also have a Wednesday evening service, which is a testimony meeting. Um, so you might find that that's a little bit reminiscent of what Quakers do. Um, they have testimony meetings as well. Um, and that's usually at those meetings, at the Sunday meeting, there's a sermon, um, but there you'd sing hymns. There's a little time for taking a collection. Um, and then a closing hymn, and that's kind of, that's the deal, <laughs> uh, very much like any Christian church service. And then the Wednesday service is going to also have a shorter sermon, um, followed by what I sometimes call a kind of an open mic time. <laughs> um, it's a space that's open for anybody in the congregation to actually get up and share um, their gratitude or inspiration, um, and especially their experiences of healing through their study of Christian science. Um, so Wednesday is kind of the, is the, the place for the proof of what we're doing. Um, Sunday is about kind of absorbing the word, and Wednesday has a little bit of that, but is also about hearing and seeing the proof of what this does for the people studying it. Um, and then we also offer in our churches Sunday school for students up to the age of 20, uh, where they would be, of course, divided into classes based on their age and would, would learn about the scriptures and also learn the fundamentals of Christian science from science and health um, with their peers and learn how to be putting those into practice in their daily life. Uh, so for us also, this involves a daily study of the Bible and our textbook, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, um, and daily prayer for ourselves, our communities, and the world. Um, and you might have also heard of the Christian Science Monitor newspaper, um, which I can talk more about in a little bit, but um, I just want to tie that in because this idea of praying for the world, for a lot of students of Christian Science, um, the, the Christian Science Monitor, which is is just a Pulitzer Prize winning newspaper. It's not a religious publication, if you're not familiar with it, um, is a resource to, to kind of understand what, what prayers the world needs <laughs> uh, and to read, to read about and understand what's happening in the world, but with that lens of like, how, do I, how can I pray um, to try to resolve whatever kind of things are happening and also to see to see where good is happening as well. Um, so then two other points, uh, 
there are some students of Christian science that are what we refer to as practitioners. And these people devote their full-time professional work to Christian science healing. So they have no other profession. This is what they do is all, you know, all day long, every day. <laughs> They're available to take calls and visits from anybody who's seeking healing and, and really anybody. It, you don't have to be a student of Christian science to call a Christian science practitioner. You just need to be like open and willing to, to kind of work with them and hear what they have to say in order to try to help you. Um, and then there are also Christian science nurses and uh, that might seem like a funny thing to pair with people who are praying. <laughs> um, but the, these nurses have training in providing non-medical nursing care to anybody who's relying on Christian science for healing. Um, so if, um, if I were to need, if I were to be like badly injured and had bandages and I needed someone to help me while, while I was earnestly praying for healing of that injury, but I needed some practical help of changing bandages and cleaning wounds, or if I, was unable to, um, to like toilet and bathe myself, some a, a Christian science nurse could, could assist me with that. And, and the reason why someone might call on the help of a Christian science nurse instead of just any kind of aid um, would be that that person also has a deep understanding of the Christian science prayer that's happening at the same time and can work with that and support that. Um, instead of say bringing in somebody else who doesn't understand that and thinks that you're kind of ridiculous for trying to pray about this injury that you have, um, which wouldn't be very supportive of, of what you were trying to do. Um, so this is just an example um, back to this idea of praying for ourselves and for our communities every day. One of our instructions is to pray each day with this prayer, which um, if those of you who are familiar with the Christian prayers draws on a line from the Lord's, what's called the Lord's prayer. So thy kingdom come, which comes straight out of what's called the Lord's prayer. Let the reign of divine truth, life, and love be established in me and rule out of me all sin. And may thy word, God's word, enrich the affections of all mankind and govern them. Uh, so that's just one example of one way that we're instructed to pray every day. One of the questions that was asked was, sure. and I figured I'd ask since we're on that part right there. Yeah. Um, did Mary Baker Eddy use natural any natural remedies in her healing that you know of? Um, so she so she did early in her work. Um, when well, so try I'll try to keep this brief, but she. So she had throughout her her adult life and, and really starting in her childhood was not a very healthy person um, and struggled with, uh, with chronic illness. And so she spent a long time before, so she, she founded this church when it, she was in her 50s, um, is if I'm doing the math right. <laughs> So if, if she founded the church in 1879, she was born in 1821, almost 60. Right. Is right. that right? Um, Good. So, so <laughs> she spent a long time before that exploring a lot of other things before she came to this and then really like dug in and started to understand it and see the results. Um, so, so certainly in her earlier adulthood of seeking healing solutions to her ill health. Um, she did a lot of different things. She tried homeopathy. She studied other kind of mind cure things of the time. Right, um, right. Then, then I, I do think that there was a kind of transition period where she was using homeopathic principles in her as she started healing other people. Um, she was kind of mixing them because she didn't she was, you know, she was still trying to understand that herself. And she comments on that in Science and Health, how she had started, um, she, she was, one of the ways that she came to a, a, a kind of greater understanding of the mental nature of disease and the need to really like leave behind any efforts to just kind of meddle with 
a material body to try to fix things and to really like turn fully to spirit as the solution was that she was administering homeopathic remedies to her um, to her patients. And she found as she was doing that, that I, I don't fully understand homeopathy. So forgive me if I'm not articulating this very well, but um, what she describes is like one of the things that that does is administering a medication, but then attenuating it to and, and sort of changing the dosage. And so what she was doing was like, so reducing it and basically reducing it to the point that there was no actual like medicating agent in like what she placebo. was giving right. to her like patients well, basically like so that it became a placebo and she would find right. that they were still healed. And so that made her think like, okay, there's clearly something going on here that's right. not just whatever this chemical is that I'm giving this person. And what is that? And so, um, so, so anyway, that's just part of part of the transition that she went through uh, before getting to taking a very absolute stance um, af after founding her church. And as she started like really seriously teaching Christian science and articulating this, the principle behind it of not relying on, on material remedies at all. Right. And that would, that would include also like laying on of hands or massage or any other thing. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I believe it does. Um, there was another question, but I don't know if you want to answer that later. I might, yeah, I might, rather than getting so, sort of pulled yeah. off. So, yeah, <laughs> I was thinking, this, go ahead and that's go. That's a good question yeah. and I'm totally happy to answer it, but let's yeah, save But I'm thinking we'll, we'll come back to it. Yeah. Um, so, so then a little bit back to the church organization. Um, as I mentioned, this the first Church of Christ Scientist in Boston, what we call the Mother Church, is the headquarters of the global movement. Um, then there are branch churches all over the world in about 60 countries. And of course, mo mo most heavily concentrated in the United States since this is where the, the church was founded. Um, the I just as a side note, I had attended a lecture or a presentation um, a, a couple of years ago when things were still happening in person, um, where they were talking about um, some of the the work of early, like early first and second generation students of Mary Baker Eddy and described one man who kind of traveled extensively giving lectures about Christian science and actually like spent a lot of time lecturing in Afghanistan mm. and I was just that kind of just blew my mind I mean because Afghanistan was such a different place <laughs> back in the True. first half of the 20th century yes because uh, I think of there's there's for sure not a Christian science church in Afghanistan now um but that was just like a place that this guy went to give lectures <laughs> uh and that kind of, that just is like, wow, um, how times have changed, but also just a, an evidence of like how broadly this does reach. Um, right, right, yeah. So then I had mentioned in our, in, in the slide about um, our church services that are about our, our practice that we attend church services. I said that there's a sermon, which is true, but I'm using that word a little, um, a little more broadly, maybe than people think of it. Um, so we we don't have clergy in our church. We have a universal impersonal pastor, which is the Bible and science and health. Um, and that might seem funny to think of <laughs> two books as being a pastor, but really they are. And that's, I think it's kind of cool to know that any time, any time of day under any circumstance or any difficulty that you're facing, you don't have to like, wait until your pastor, a person is on duty or something, but you can just go to these books and find the answers and find the inspiration in the scripture and in science and health as the explanation of that. Um, and so what this also means is that every single Christian science church all over the world has the same pastor. Um, so there's not the kind of personalness of having different preachers in different places who might have different agendas or different interpretations 
um, or even different political beliefs that seep into their preaching. Um, and, and then what our, what our service looks like is this next bullet that we have a standardized weekly sermon that's made up of citations from these two books. Um, and that's published three months in advance. Uh, nobody probably reads them that far in advance. Uh, but the idea is that, so the, the sermon this week is called, the, the subject is sacrament. And that, um, that's understood as the sermon for the week of July, let's see, July 4th was Monday through July 10th. So it's going to be read out loud in the church service tomorrow, but it's something that all of us students of Christian science have had either printed out or I have it on my phone and have been studying it on my own um, throughout the week as, as a kind of guide and a, and a tool for self-study. And those, uh, there are 26 subjects of these sermons that repeat twice during the year although the actual citations that make up the content of the sermon are not repeated. Um, but that those are adapted actually from the, I'm not gonna get the name quite right, but the International Sunday School curriculum that was, uh, was in existence at the time of very big ready life. It may be still, although it's probably changed, um, but a, a series of standardized um, subjects for Sunday school lessons that she took and then adapted to the theology of Christian science. And so I, I think it's fun to know that history because then it helps me think, oh, like I'm, I'm like conducting my own <laughs> like self-taught Sunday school class here by studying these lessons and they go through kind of progressive subjects. So we're, we happen to be at the very beginning of the cycle right now sacrament is the second <coughs> subject. The very first one is God. Um, so we're kind of just starting with the basics and then it gets a, a little bit more complex and more deep into different um, points about Christian science practice as it goes through that six month cycle. Um, and if I'm yeah. correct, if I remember from when you, when we had this conversation a couple of years ago, yeah, isn't it the same? At, is it the same things being studied like nationwide, I would say yes, worldwide. Right. But at, every, right. at every single Christian science church. So whether you go to a church in Washington, DC tomorrow or a church in Kinshasa, Uganda, or is that, is Kinshasa in Uganda or is that Democratic Republic of Congo? I hope nobody <laughs> who knows better than me thinks that I'm a fool for saying that right now. Uh, or if you go to the Christian science church in Hong Kong or in One Rio de Janeiro, you're going to hear the same sermon in the local language, but it will be it, it will be the same at every single church around. I the world. remember, I remember you saying that. And I, for those of you that were on the call with me on Thursday, um, when we discussed the um, Jehovah's Witness faith, it, that is the same for the Jehovah's Witness faith. I forgot oh, to mention okay. that. Is yeah. that whatever is is decided is discussed worldwide at the mm -hmm. same time? And yeah. so I thought that that was a neat parable between parallel yeah, yeah, between yeah. those That's, i didn't know that about jehovah's Witnesses. yeah that whatever studied is studied worldwide mm -hmm. at the same time and i think like for example there's i believe in the in jewish practice there's it's not it's not so much at at a particular service but there's a time of year when they study the torah and everyone everyone is yeah, who chooses to so. participate sort of studies it at the same time and goes through the the Pentateuch at the same uh, sort yeah, of at the I same pace. So. Um, so yeah, I think there's there's certainly precedent um, and parallels in other faiths of having that kind of shared shared study. Um, so then finally, we have uh, weekly and monthly magazines that are published by the Christian Science Publishing Society, which is the building that um, whoever it was that asked the question went to in Boston to see the Mapparium. Um, and that's one of them is a, the monthly magazine is called the Journal of Christian Science. Uh, and the Sentinel is the, the, the Christian Science Sentinel is the weekly magazine. And 
um, fun thing to know about both of those. And then there's also a monthly Heraldo, which is the foreign language publication. So that's, I believe that's published in Spanish, Portuguese, French, German. I think there are five, but I can't remember what the fifth one is. Spanish, Portuguese, French, German. Well, anyway, whatever language there might be another one. Um, and all, all of those magazines have a section in them, every single issue of testimonies of healing, which have been verified by either people who witnessed the healing or who can vouch for the, for the integrity of the testifier. And, and all, all of them have to have three verifications before being published. And those are contemporary modern day examples of Christian healing. And you'll see all kinds of things from, from what might seem like a kind of minor, like I twisted my ankle and I prayed about it to having cancer or multiple scler sclerosis or um, people in dire financial straits that find, find a solution and a way out of their trouble um, through prayer. And so every, again, every single issue of every one of those magazines has a section um, with those modern day testimonies of healing. Um, okay, so that essentially concludes my prepared comments. Um, these are just a few websites. Uh, if, you're, if you're just curious to understand more are my my church sixth church of christ scientist in washington dc their sixthchurchdc.org um the main website of the whole denomination that's maintained by the church in boston is christianscience.com um jsh stands for journal sentinel herald and that's the basically the website of those magazines so if you wanted to go look up a um a testimony or an inspirational article about some specific kind of problem or just anything that's that's inspirational or, or useful for the time, for example, praying about political division in our country or um, whatever, you could go to jsh.christianscience.com, also the Christian Science Monitor newspaper, um, and then finally the Mary Baker Eddy Library, which is located also in that complex in Boston. Um, and they sort of specialize in, uh, they have an archive of Mary Baker Eddy's writings and um, they do other work with scholars that research the history of Christian science and have a podcast and stuff. Um, so if you were kind of a history nerd and wanted to understand more about that, uh, that's a good resource. Um, and I'm realizing I didn't really talk, there was something, well, I don't know. Anyway, uh, as Christina and I were reminiscing or, or commiserating at the beginning that she's getting over COVID and I have a six month old baby. So we're both kind of like, not, two halves. we're thinking not two halves totally make a whole. Two is like, if we don't do it, we're just I'm sorry, capacity, I'm sorry. Operationally here. So <laughs> um, um, I was going to tell you the other language was Linda said was Italian. Oh, Italian. Thank you. This was the other language. Thank you. We we like it when we get the help. We need. I was like, what's the, what's the other European language that's in there? I'm sure that I'm sure that that's what it is. It's, uh, it's, yeah. So good, Italian. All right, so um, that helps. Thank you, Linda. All right. Oh, I, and actually, here oh, I, yes, I said that I was done, more. but I'm actually not done. See, <laughs> okay, keeping my I'll I'll get through these fast because I know we we have only 15 minutes. I don't know if you said this was an hour long. We have as long as you want to stay. But we, yeah, wanna, we have some questions at the end. So go ahead, go through. I don't want to keep you longer than you planned to be here. So I'll go through these quick. Um, so Christian scientists believe that prayer heals. Um, Sometimes you, you may have heard from somebody saying that Christian scientists don't believe in doctors. Um, well, I don't believe in unicorns, but of course I believe in doctors and the work that they do. Um, we respect and appreciate the dedication and selflessness of workers in the med medical profession. However, we do believe that prayer heals and it's typical of students of Christian science to turn to prayer first as a resort for any kind of problem, including health problems. Um, the church doesn't prohibit us 
from seeking medical care. And that's something, that choice is something that's up to every individual um, facing every particular issue at any particular time. Um, so there's no, you're not going to be ostracized from your church or excommunicated if you decide to take a pill or have a surgery or whatever. That's just something that you choose for yourself um, at whatever moment you need to make a choice. Um, we also practice the golden rule. Um, so whatever I choose to do, I'm not going to impose on anybody else. Uh, and I also, for me, this is also like Christian science is a, back to that idea that Christian science is a discipline and it's something that does take work and dedication. So for me to impose that on somebody else doesn't make any sense because they're like, if you're not, if you're not sort of doing the work that accompanies it, it, it doesn't make sense to be forced to do that because it may not yield the same results for a person who, who like is, is doing it resentfully or is being, being forced and not even wanting to do, uh, to do something or to, to use. Yes, very true. Um, yes. Oh, I forgot that I made these like double clicky. Um, Christian science isn't Scientology. <laughs> Our name sounds a little bit similar, um, but we're not the same. Christian Science was founded, as I said, the church was founded in 1879. Our textbook was published in 1875. My understanding is that Scientology, um, the church was the church was founded in 1954 or something. Um, they're very different. I won't speak to what Scientology is or isn't or anything about the merits of that because I don't know. Uh, we're just not the same. <laughs> right. And I was going to say for anybody interested in that, my cousin is a Scientologist. Oh, well, yeah. And he maybe has done. You have a, maybe you have an event coming he up. Has, he has. I don't know. On our, on our YouTube page, we have um, two videos that I have recorded with him doing questions and answers about what Scientology is. And he is a non practicing Scientologist. Like, um, but he, but he did very good to, two years in a row to a good conversation on what Scientology is. Okay. So I thought that was interesting as well. Right. I you I think you would find that what he tells you is very different than what I told you today. It's very different, yes. Yeah. Um then Christian scientists study and review the Bible. We're students of the Bible. What we do is Bible based. We believe in the Judeo Christian Islamic, I should have said that Judeo Christian Islamic God. Uh, and we follow Jesus. Mary Baker Eddy, the founder, was a Congregationalist until she founded her own church. And that, as I've mentioned, was at the age of 58. Um, we also study the Bible and read it on our own. And we hear it read in church twice a week. I actually have a friend who is a, um, is a soloist. So she sings regularly in Christian science churches. And she commented at one time that of all the churches that she's ever sung in, she probably hears the most scripture actually read aloud in our churches compared with any other denomination that she's sung for. Um, so we're students of the Bible. Uh, um, so this is just a, a, a kind of illustration of that from Mary Baker Eddy in her own words, I have set forth Christian science and its application to the treatment of disease, just as I have discovered them. I have demonstrated through mind or God the effects of truth on the health, longevity, and morals of men, and I have found nothing in ancient or modern systems on which to found my own, except the teachings and demonstration of our great master, Jesus Christ, and the lives of prophets and apostles. The Bible has been my only authority. I have no other guide in the straight and narrow way of truth. Uh, lastly, Christian science is a deeply Christian faith. We worship one God with Jesus and the prophets as our example. Mary Baker Eddy founded the church, but we don't worship her. Um, I like to think, to, to sort of borrow the terminology, although you, you probably wouldn't hear Christian scientists say this amongst ourselves very much, um, but I think it's useful to use the word prophet to talk about her. She's not, she's not God. She's not the second coming of Christ. She's not another Messiah. She's a prophet. You know, she like she's a guide and and shared this inspiration that she had, which she believes was revealed to her from God. 
um, but we don't worship her. And she actually very specifically, if you were to if you were to study deeply kind of the structure of our church, I think you would find that it's very intentionally designed to discourage idolizing her or idolizing any anybody um, or ma making the te teaching personal or kind of personally about her or thinking that she's the agent of healing. Um, and he explains in, um, in a, a talk that she gave to members of her church in 1901. Finally, brethren, wait patiently on God, return blessing for cursing, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Be steadfast, abide and abound in faith, understanding and good works. Study the Bible and the textbook of our denomination. Obey strictly the laws that be and follow your leader only so far as she follows Christ. Um, so then I just thought I'd include here the tenets of our church. Um, I'll just pause and let you read these yourselves rather than reading them aloud, uh, but you can just kind of ponder ponder these. Um, I won't, th this sort of invites a, a very detailed conversation about our theology. So I think like I'll say, let's not ask really specific questions about these because that would take us way off topic for a very long time, um, but you can just consider them briefly. Okay, that's probably enough time for that. So I'll move to the next slide. Um, I think we'll just skip, this is not a very big space that I'm sitting in. It has two, two rooms. I'm sitting in one of them. There's another one on the other side of a glass wall over there with some cushy chairs and a little table, a display table, a reading room. I should have said this earlier is um, a bookstore and a study space. I think of it as part library, part bookstore, part coffee shop. <laughs> um, it's a place where you could come to study and just have a quiet place to think and pray and read. It's a place where you can purchase um, Bibles and Science and Health and other writings by Mary Baker Eddy and Bible study resources. Um, it's also, we have a lending library, which you might be able to see, but maybe not see the sign behind me. Um, so you could borrow books uh, to start your study. We are also, there's some little study carols across the room from me. So you could come and study yourself here. Um, so that's what this, this space is. And, I, and like I said about everything before, it's totally open. I mean, we, you know, we don't want people just coming here and here and reading the newspaper, but <laughs> anyone who has a, a kind of sincere desire to to engage in spiritual study is totally welcome here. And it's also, there's always a staff person on in attending um, and, and opening the space, but that that person isn't charged with like converting everyone that comes in the door. <laughs> They're here as a resource to answer questions and to engage in conversation if the visitor wants that, but they're not gonna like accost you when you come in and try to convert you the the great commission is not part of what christian science does we don't have a command to get out there and i mean you know the bible tells us to preach the gospel to every creature but we don't understand that as a sort of proselytizing instruction um the way other groups do so that's just to say that if you've ever felt any kind of hesitation about coming into a reading room because you thought that someone was just gonna like try to change your mind about everything, that's not what's gonna happen here. Um, so, and then finally, um, at reading rooms, 
like I said, you can buy the Bible, different translations of the Bible, you can buy science and health in English and other languages. There are more languages than the ones that I mentioned in the Geraldo. Uh, I don't know if I have, we have Dutch, German, Spanish, Russian, Portuguese, Polish, Norwegian, Swedish, Indonesian, uh, a bunch of German, French, I don't think that's all of them, but there's a lot. This has been translated into quite a few languages. Um, also the magazines that I mentioned um, and what you're looking at behind me is a bunch of um, bound volumes of past issues going all the way back to the founding of these magazines in 1889. So if I were to pick up the one that's at the farthest corner up there, I could read you an article or a testimony that was written by someone about healing in 1889. Um, so that's what this wall is, but there's also an online archive that you could use to look up. Um, I think what's especially cool about that is that you can look up um, keywords. So if you were facing a particular kind of health challenge or other challenge and you wanted to hear see examples of how that had been healed, you could actually look that up and find mm -hmm. Um, I mean, not, you know, not the rarest of diseases, because there's just a, a kind of population mis mismatch <laughs> there. Um, but for sure, like most common illnesses, you can find an example of how that's been healed um, in that archive. Also biographies and then um, music, and we have a lending library. Okay, now that it's 2.58. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're, we'll just take a quick few minutes here. Um, so first, Gail was letting everybody know, for anyone interested, the Boston Christian Science Complex is amazing, and they do, or they did before COVID, offer tours. Um, then she also commented to let you know that the Oxford Dictionary definition of a prophet is a person regarded as an inspired teacher or proclaimer of the will of God. So that certainly fits in your book already. Yeah, thank you. Um, Linda said, amazing, amazing presentation. Thank you both. I mean, I did nothing, but you know, but you're welcome. You're here manning the Zoom so that I don't <laughs> have to think about that. This is an amazing presentation. And then um, Gail said also, this was extremely interesting. Thank you so much to both Rachel and the Sixth Church for sharing her information and to Christina, the Atlantic Institute for hosting this. Um, there were a few questions up above. Yeah. And so before that, we'll go to what, Catherine was asking what version of the Bible does Christian science use? That's a good question. Um, so there's no, there's no sort of like formal instruction about which one you should use. What you will most likely hear if you attend a Christian science church is the King James version of the Bible. Um, and the primary reason for that is that that's the translation that Mary Baker Eddy used. And so it's the one that pairs most easily with science and health when it when they're read aloud, because she's going to quote, she'll be quoting the Bible in various places in that book, and and those quotes are going to come from the King James version. Um, but there's, you know, it's not that we're not allowed to use other versions, and um, you'll, I think you'll find you'd find that a lot of Christian scientists do explore deeply other translations in order to just kind of like get a more expansive understanding of what a particular verse might be trying to say. Um, and, and also digging into like the, the Greek and Hebrew roots of words to try to make sense of, of what their real meaning is and get the, high, the kind of most spiritual sense that they can from them. Right, right. Um. Dory asked a question. She was, she asked, she's first, she had like three questions. Um, and I'm going backwards, I'm going up in the bottom. So it says, do, do Christian scientists accept medical care? Do they heal non-Christian science members? And then who reads the Wednesday topic and do you all discuss it? For sure. So um, I'll tackle those first two together. As I mentioned mm -hmm. about practitioners, like anybody can call a Christian science practitioner for healing. Um, they're not going to give you a, you don't have to like make a statement of faith. <laughs> they're not going to give you a quiz. Um, they're kind of the only condition is that you have an openness and a willingness to, to explore Christian science. Um, I, I have, I'm familiar with some examples even of people that 
kind of would appear to have not had very much willingness. Like there's a there's a published testimony um, that's not even, I think it was published in the 80s maybe, um, of a, a man who whose wife was a Christian scientist and he was um, experiencing and suffering from a tremor in his hand that was a, a hereditary thing. And he was sort of respectful of his wife's practice, but not interested and quite skeptical of it, uh, but loved her anyway. And so after some time when this tremor was getting to be kind of a problem and preventing him from doing the things that he needed to do, his wife sort of approached him and was like, okay, you need to do something about this. You know, I don't, I don't care what it is. You can see a doctor or whatever, or you can call a Christian science practitioner, but you need to do something because this is affecting just the daily things that you're trying to do. And so he reluctantly agreed to have to go visit the office of a Christian science practitioner. And then um, I won't, well, I don't know all the details of that anyway, but uh, the, the conclusion of the story is that he went there, the practitioner talked to him briefly about God and his relationship to God, and then gave him, I think, a copy of the magazine or something and just said, like, you read this for a little bit and I will pray. And we're just going to kind of be here quietly. You read that, I'll be praying. And then um, after some time, this practitioner kind of called him back to the desk and asked him to write something down. And he did with the hand that had the tremor with no issue at all. And that was the end of it. And it was totally healed. And he and he describes at the end of the article, I went in as certain at that time of the non-existence of God as I am as of the existence of God today because of this healing. So he was very much like not, I mean, willing to have gone because his wife said you have to do something, but like not, <laughs> not like really enthusiastic about it. And and he was healed. Um so. So that's enough. Anyway, that's all to say, yes, non-members can be healed. Um, there just has to be a willingness to like let the practitioner do their work. Um, and it's a letting then, go. It's a letting go of, of yeah, all your stuff. And, and a lot of, very much open. a lot of like letting go of your own agenda and right. your own fears and, and even your own expectations of how a re resolution of your problem is going to come about. Right. Um, so then, Bob Bob was wondering if there was a charge for that. There, yes, that's a good question. There is a charge. So like I said, Christian science practitioners are, are enabled or are kind of permitted to list publicly as practitioners of Christian science because they have no other profession. They're, they're devoted exclusively to that work. Um, and the important thing about that is that that means you if you call them, they're going to answer the phone and they're going to be available. They're not going to say, oh, I'm at, I'm at my other job now or like I'm right. painting someone's right. house right now. I can help you later. They're going to be ready and available to help you right at that moment. Um, and that's any time of day that you call. Um, they, they are also not employed by the church. Um, so, of course, most of them are going to be a member of a church somewhere. Um, but it may be that they live in a place where there isn't a church, so they might not be a member of a local church, but uh, they're not employees of that church, so they're not receiving a salary from the church to do their work. That's just the profession that they've chosen because of their love for God and their love for helping humanity. Um, and so they need to be paid for their work because that's their living, right, right. Um, just like any other, you know, a psychologist or a nurse or anybody else who's engaged in a profession of helping people um that's they they have a charge that's something that they set individually there's not a a kind of mandated price um one thing except that you i don't think you would find this to be true but the instruction given by mary baker Eddy is that um christian science practitioners should charge a rate that's equivalent or comparable to what a respected physician in their community would charge. Um, that is, especially today with the way that our insurance markets work and the way that that has caused an inflation of medical prices, you would not find that to be true. Um, I would say that most practitioners charge between 25 and $100 
usually per day for their treatment um, as compared to like what like a one visit for, like for example my husband went to a chiropractor so 130 or 160 dollars for one visit to the chiropractor um, and many Christian science practitioners because there's there's sort of an instruction but it's not super specific um, about how to execute this is that if the treatment goes on for a, an extended period of time that they ought to reduce their charge. Um, so what you'd find is that many practitioners will reduce their charge by say half after three days. If, you're, if your problem isn't healed after three days, then they reduce their charge going forward for as long as you choose to continue um, enlisting them to pray with you, pray for you. Um, anyway, that's a, a long answer to your question, but <laughs> I hope that answers it. Um, and then um, I did I didn't finish answering this other question about the Wednesday topic. Um, so so to to widen that a little bit, the Sunday sermons because I think there was another question about. Yeah, this. I was going to say. Let me read the other question too. It says, "Is there any type of human leader at the services? Right. Who chooses or adapts the sermons? Are there leaders for Sunday school?" Yeah, and then we so can I'll, I'll answer all of those together. Yeah. Um, so there, so there are Sunday school teachers. Um, I'm, I was a Sunday school teacher until I had my baby. So I'm not doing that <laughs> right now. Um, but there, the, and the, the requirements of Sunday school teachers are that they're a member of the church and also a member of the mother church. Um, and I kind of, it's not a written requirement, but usually a sort of an expectation that they've been studying Christian science for some time, not that they just joined yesterday. Uh, right. So that they have some understanding about themselves and practice using this in order to try to teach it to somebody else. Um, then there, as I mentioned, there's no clergy in our churches. The, we have lay readers that conduct the services. So the, the sermon for Sundays that is read all over the world, that's prepared by a committee um, in Boston. Um, so that's, that, that's how it comes to be and how it's disseminated to all of the branch churches around the world. And then um, those, the, each congregation <laughs> will elect from among the members two readers to read on Sundays. So you have one person reading the Bible and one person reading Science and Health. Um, and as the, the pairing of citations in the lesson goes, uh, and then it's the, the first reader, um, the person who's reading Science and Health, that then is the reader for Wednesdays. So that person for Wednesdays will actually design their own um, sort of sermon of citations that is just going to be from their own inspiration. Often they will choose a sort of contemporary topic. So, you know, it might be kind of focusing on healing division or if, uh, I don't know if uh, like, if probably the week of that shooting in Texas, may, many first readers probably had a particular sermon planned. And then when that happened, I don't remember what day of the week it was, but if it had been on a Monday or Tuesday, they probably like, threw out their their plan yeah. and pulled a different one together. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so just one other yeah. question to ask was, are the readers paid or are they elected volunteers? Is anybody uh, the, in the church paid? Um, it depends on the church. So like at, at our church, for example, the readers are, um, given a kind of an honorarium that that many of them choose to to forego and just say either they either they donate it back to the church or they just say like I don't need you to pay me that um other times they're strictly volunteer it's kind of just dependent dependent on the budget and financial resources of the church um but they're not they're not kind of like salaried employees the way that a pastor would be yeah, okay. right. So they right, oh, they're compensated right. sometimes, but that's just that's just dependent right. on the specific bylaws of the individual church. 
Right. Okay. Um, now Bob had this question all the way up here. Um, so we did, yeah, that question that we pointed. and I we didn't we didn't you know so we could oh but by the way he did say also his son-in-law used to work for I am Ty okay he oh yeah the uh, um, right so he, yeah yes so um <coughs> are there any gray areas or debates as to what is considered medical and what isn't um so I think. So there's not there. So it's not that there's a particular like section of science and health that like lays out all the kinds of treatments that you shouldn't should or shouldn't do. Um, I, I think that this is something that each individual. Well, each individual gets has the opportunity right to choose. What yeah, I guess to choose and also it. has to sort through themselves about what is and what isn't. Right. Um, I see the next question too about tithing. Um, right. So um, it, it's very much just like a thing that each person sorts through themselves. Um, so, so some, for example, if you were to ask a, a Christian scientist whether they take vitamins, like the range of answers that you're going to get from from a hundred different students of Christian science is probably a hundred different things. Like my sense of it, and I, I can only share what I feel. I'm not speaking for everyone or for for the teachings of Christian science. My sense of it is that the underlying principle is that we want to be turning to God's spirit and spiritual understanding as the basis of our health. And so anything that has a material basis would sort of fall into that category of like, that's not the direction I wanna go. And so that would include vitamins um, in addition to like a, a what would more strictly be considered like a medication mm -hmm. or a medical treatment. Um, but, but everyone, you know, that's not what necessarily another Christian scientist across the room would tell you about what they understand and yeah. what they feel. And sometimes it's different in different uh, areas of the world. For sure. Um, you different know, culture, like, different culture of people. They might be more open right. to. There's this foundational truth, but then of course that's getting filtered. And, we're, you know, culture. we're all, we're all trying to get as close to truth as we can, but like right. the, the old analogy of like, the five blind men touching an elephant, like each of them is going to tell you different things based on whether they're right. touching the ears or the tail or the feet. So we're all doing our best to get to that truth, but it's co it's coming through a filter of our own experiences and our own culture and all of that. So, um, so, so I guess the answer is there's a, t a ton of gray area. <laughs> yes, that's um, probably it. That is probably the answer. There is a ton of gray area. Yep. Yeah. So then this question, what percent is the tithe? There's not, um, there's no requirement of the tithe. Like the, in our, in our membership application for my particular branch church, it just says that if you're, if you become a member, like, are you, do you expect to be contributing financially and also offering your prayers for in support of the church? But there's no, there's no requirement about how much that is. Right. Okay. Very good. It seems like all questions have stopped. Any other? Three fifteen. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? What's the path to becoming a practitioner? Um. Yeah. Uh, so, I. So what's, So a practitioner. There. So there are some basic requirements. Um. One. The first is that. Thank you, Gail. <laughs> Um, in all caps, uh, the, so a practitioner, the fundamental requirement is that a practitioner must have taken a course that's called primary class instruction. That's a 12 day or two week course about healing. And that is taught by a, um, 
an authorized teacher of Christian science. And that's all, all of that is sort of, that vetting is done through, through departments at the mother church. Um, but this course, this two week course called primary class instruction that's taught by an authorized teacher of Christian science. Um, and it's based on a chapter in science and health. So although, although this course is required, the, the content of the course is readily available to anybody um, and should, should be the foundation of anybody's attempt to try to understand and use this to heal themselves and to heal other people. Um, but you would take this two week course. I've taken that course. So it's not that that course makes me a practitioner but I cannot become a practitioner without having taken that course. And then um, in order to become a practitioner, you most people go through a kind of transitional phase, if you will, of probably, probably having had some other job <laughs> and then gradually intensifying their study of Christian science and finding that they're they're encountering opportunities to offer or being called upon by people that they know to pray with, for and heal um, to the point that that just kind of overtakes whatever they were doing before. And they find that they're, this is not everybody's path, but I, I in my conversations with people, a common one um, that just like you start to get enough people asking you that you, you're you not really being honest to your other employer about how much work you're doing for them. And it just is right at a particular time to say, I should really stop doing this other thing and dedicate myself fully to this. Other people right. really just like take the plunge and just quit their job and, and maybe don't have any patience and aren't getting calls right when they start and have to sort of work through a period of of just being dedicated about their study and being open. And then and then over time, starting to have people call them and reach out to them. Um, and, then, and then in order to be sort of the most official designation as a practitioner is to be listed in the directory of practitioners in the Christian Science Journal. Um, and so also if you, if you wanted to find a practitioner, because that was sort of the, the other half of the question is like, would you, how would we check them out like we do doctors? Um, if you wanted to find a practitioner to call on, you could turn to this directory that's organized by, by uh, geographic location. Um, every person that's listed in that directory has been vetted by this department of the mother church and the requirement for in that application is that you've taken this class, primary class instruction, and that you have affidavits from three people who have been healed by your work. And I believe that two of those have to be physical healings. So some, oh, some sort right. of physical Ill illness, not just like I was feeling depressed one day or I couldn't pay my bill one day and the person prayed about it and something happened and I was able to pay it, but like actual healings of physical illness or other kinds of health problems. Um, so that, so those are the, the foundational requirements, this class, and then these affidavits of support from people who you've healed in order to get into that journal. But you, you can find people who, for example, our practitioners are part-time practitioners. So they might say that they have office hours and they are, they are, probably perfectly capable and have experience and and are, are reliable people that you could call on for healing they're just not they haven't gone through that full vetting process and they're not full-time so they're not allowed to be listed in the directory great explanation thank you very much and dory's a great explanation and presentation thank you that and you're, and, you're welcome and teresa said too thank you for a great presentation and for sharing and I can, um, one other thing that I can do is share, um, share a link to that directory, if anyone is curious. And these, so although these people collect a card for their work, most often 
they are totally happy to have a kind of introductory conversation with you at no cost. Um, sometimes they will charge as, as other professionals in other fields do, like they might have a, a different lower fee for like a consultation or they might offer a first consultation free, but if you're gonna keep calling them and wanting to continue having conversations, they might they might have a charge for that. But most mostly, I think that you could feel confident that anybody listed in this directory would gladly have an introductory conversation with you about Christian science and about how they work um, at no cost. And, and it's, perfectly understood and welcomed that in that opening conversation, you ask them how much they're gonna charge and how they work. Uh, for example, some, some will say that you, that you should contact them every day and, and tell them whether you would like them to continue praying that day and that they won't unless they hear from you. Others say, I'm gonna keep praying for you every day until you tell me to stop. So it, that those are just kind of things that like, you just wanna have a conversation with them about how they work and what their expectation is um, when, you, when you work with them, because it's gonna vary from person to person. Yes, very true. Um, all right, thank you very much, Rachel. I appreciate you taking the time to do this and to set everything up and to meet with all of us. Letting me go 22 minutes over time. <laughs> uh. I, I don't.